This is episode 48 of the Fitness Plus Technology Podcast with Brian O'Rourke, president of the Fitness Industry Technology Council. And what we're going to see is that humans are really moving into a hybrid state where technology and humanity will merge and where the distinction between physical and digital experience will become less clear over time. Welcome to the Fitness Plus Technology Podcast for club owners, operators, and fitness professionals. I am your host, Josh Trent, and this is your number one trusted resource for the accelerating world of fitness technology. Each week, we bring you an expert interview with a global influencer at the crossroads of fitness and technology. You'll gain the insights, tools, and inspiration you need to stay connected to the pulse of what matters most for your fitness business in the age of exponential technologies. On this podcast, we explore the deeper impact of the 2017 fitness industry technology trends and beyond for the era of exponential growth with the president of the FITSE Council, Brian O'Rourke. This is a special featured podcast from the FITSE webinar recorded live just days ago. With technology becoming not just a thing we use, but something we will become using with no boundaries, Brian reminds us that if we can think it, it can be. Yet even with all the tech that is creating more opportunity in and out of the fitness space than ever before, we also must understand the unforeseen consequences that tech is producing and how we can adapt to transcend the negativity around those changes. You'll learn why Brian believes we're in the knee of the curve when it comes to rapid adoption and creation of new exponential tech, how this relates to the four key driver dynamics of why tech must serve specific purposes for businesses, including omnipresence, personalized service, sustainability, and aesthetic UX design. Brian also uncovers how Amazon is using data points, cognition, algorithms, and how this affects a new paradigm of value creation when we look at our older paradigms that were less data centric from ai coaching habit dna based customized eating plans elf mindfulness tech ai therapy augmented reality and so much more brian spotlights how the fitness industry can leverage these new technologies to deliver higher value business models that support growing our industry and why he believes we will shift away from the negative consequences of tech to ubiquitous delivery that makes tech more like the air we breathe more powerful and more able to impact our fitness business than ever before. Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Really excited today to spend a few minutes with you talking about the latest in fitness technology. It's a FITC webinar for today and the 20th, I guess, of September 2017. We're going to go through some ideas that I hope you'll find to be stimulating. We actually have a slide deck that will have these slides in it on our slide share account. They will be released tomorrow morning. So keep a look at your social feeds. And as Jesse mentioned, We'll share the recording both in um, the video form with the webinar content as well as in a podcast form. So we hope you're listening later and share this openly with the community. Before we get started, I hope you all have been enjoying the Fitness Industry Technology Council podcasts. Uh, You know you can get those on all the major platforms, iTunes, YouTube, Stitcher, all of them. We've had some really fantastic guests And if you or any brands that you know would like to sponsor this podcast, please consider it. Literally tens of thousands of people listen every week around the world to the content. And I think we have some fantastic leaders uh, sharing their real world uh, view of technology adoption in the fitness space. Several of our board members and colleagues will be at Club Industry in Chicago from the 4th to the 6th of October. There'll be some fantastic presentations. So if you're there, please hit up some of our friends and um, you know look for some great talks on technology. Finally, I will be in London at the URSA European Congress from the 23rd through the 26th of October. You can learn more at this link here. It's going to be a great, great event as always. Uh, this one focusing again on evolving uh, the industry with technology. So uh, that seems to be a very common theme nowadays. So without further ado, before we get started, This presentation, uh, we're going to have examples of technology, but we're going to spend a little time creating context around the latest fitness trends. And I'm going to tell you the why behind that as we go through it. So first off, we have to think about what technology is becoming. The thing that I would like to use as an example is that my son doesn't really understand what a record player is. Neither would he understand what a rotary dial phone is. Because as technology evolves, it becomes new things. And the way we think about technology now, we're biased because of our own experience. What it's going to become is is less and less boundful. We can't really bind technology. It's becoming more and more of a no boundaries 
dynamic. As I'll show you in this presentation, what's going to occur more frequently is if we can think it, it can be. And what we're going to see is that humans are really moving into a hybrid state where technology and humanity will merge and where the distinction between physical and digital experience will become less clear over time. This is an important distinction. I would really suggest you consider getting these three books and reading about them and these concepts because it will create a lot of context to what I'm referring to. Uh, First, Homo Deus uh, and its predecessor book, uh, Sapiens uh, by Harari, is a very interesting read. If you like history, if you like to learn more about the perspective I shared, he does a fantastic job. Uh, The Inevitable, I've been talking about for a little over a year with Kevin Kelly, the 12 technological forces that are shaping our future. And finally, and more recently, is uh, Max Tegmark's book, Life 3.0, on being human in the age of artificial intelligence. Elon Musk has written about this book, along with many other leading thinkers. So these books really put where we are in technology into historical context. I think it's important to try to keep a fresh mind about what's happening, because we've been so consumed by technology in the past decade with the advent of the iPhone and even before with the ubiquity of the internet. And anytime technology arises, there are unforeseen consequences. So things like people getting killed because they're texting behind the wheel of a car, or the fact that we're not active physically as much because we're all sitting behind our computers. These are unintended and unforeseen consequences that technology creates. And new technology will be invented to counteract those and create other unforeseen consequences. I think we're going to see a pushback on traditional technologies, as I'll show you, because things like the smartphone will not be uh, any longer within the next decade. And I'll show you why I think that. And we're moving to an evolution of technology being ubiquitous to the point where it's like the air we breathe. Uh, It's kind of like me being in Tokyo in July, and I had been to Tokyo many times and years ago when I didn't have a smartphone GPS device. The fact that I had access to my location and everything around me on demand changed the way I experienced the Tokyo trip, but it also made me forget what it used to be like to do things the way I did. The technology was starting to become ubiquitous, and we see that that's going to increase, and I'll share many examples of that. And I think that is conditional based on the fact that we're in this knee of the curve. When you think of an exponential curve of technology, you know, when you look at what thought leaders like Ray Kurzweil says, is that our present state and position in time relative to technology and its, its impact to us is really in that point where we're moving to a very rapid uh, adoption rate and explosion of tech. And as Ray says, that it's the nature of exponential growth that events seem to take a long time, but as you go through this knee of the curves, all of a sudden events erupt at a very furious pace. Uh, Also, Kevin Kelly, when you think about the fitness paradigm in the businesses we're in, in the infrastructure and the service models that we participate in, Uh, The truth is that the greatest products and services in our industry space have not even been invented yet. So I think we need to keep those things in mind. Also to create context, you know, we're all in businesses. We all work in organizations that are functioning around a certain mission. And so technology must serve a purpose to that. And so no matter the industry you're in, the organization you're in, I'd really look through the filter of these four key driver dynamics that technology is feeding and are going to be the main drivers for success for everyone on this call. One is omnipresence and the idea that whatever you do should have both a physical and purely digital and hybrid version of that. So it's really about whenever and wherever your participants and communities wish to participate. And we'll show you many examples of that. Also, when it comes to service, it better be relevant and personalized to the user. The more personalized it is, the more relevant and valuable it is. Another thing that's critical that we need to keep in mind around applying technology is user experience. User experience has got to be beautiful, simplistic, frictionless, uh, easy to consume like air. The better and more beautiful and simplistic user experience is, the better we will be in reaching our missions. And that's a great thing that technology can do if it's applied correctly. And finally, sustainability. Automation, driving costs down, 
improving the way to deliver quality service to drive revenue. These are the four drivers that I would really focus on as a brand or an organization. And the other thing to keep in mind in the framework is a lot of this is driven by the 16 various uh, global trend watching uh, drivers that exist today. I like this trend uh, watchers content. It's uh, very well done. And we look through the lens of what I'm talking about with respect to uh, their work. And here are examples. Personalization, we talked about. We see things like Saiku, which demonstrate that personalization, taking a unique body scan, user experience design, lots of engagement, the rise of digital services, group training, boutique experiences, service definitions, mindfulness that we'll talk about in a minute, omnipresence that I spoke about, serving people wherever and whenever they choose. All great examples of things that are being driven by consumer trends. Another thing is how technology is impacting all of this. Basically, you know, the idea that you've seen over the years of sensors collecting data and now increasingly cognition and AI being applied to create new business models and user experiences. Online digital communities where people can get together who share a common interest, be it weight loss, be it fitness communities whatever it is, new interfaces, voice, uh, which is a huge and growing interface, virtual reality with immersion, a lot of different new interfaces. So we're able to use technology in ways that we're not limited by how we're interacting with it. It becomes more and more ubiquitous and like air. And then the very nature of commerce itself, how we transact exchanges of value for those services which technology is being enabled to do in ways that are transforming whole industry segments. And these are the drivers. And again, we're going to get down to some specific examples of that in just a minute. And really what this relates to is this new paradigm of value creation for all organizations. In the old, simple paradigm of value creation, when we look at a highly valuable brand like Walmart, the way they were able to be very valuable was through having a lot of users that wanted to use what they offered. They were a low price uh, provider. They had a lot of locations they built up. They would promote themselves and deliver value in a certain way. And then they made money by getting those users to transact with them for higher amounts and more frequently. And that really was the key driver of value. The new driver and new paradigm of value creation is what Amazon and others are starting to do. They're taking many, many data points and information and collecting it to use it in ways where they can learn patterns. And they're using that learning with cognition, machine learning, data analysis, to create personalized and more valued experiences so that we anticipate need, we can deliver on that personalized experience in new ways, even anticipating what we want before we know we want it. And that creates tremendous retention, loyalty, it makes something in Amazon something we start to think we can't do without. We can see this showing up in many different industry spaces, and I use this as a simple paradigm of how things are shifting. And we've got to keep this in mind no matter the business model you're in. Another thing when we look at the latest uh, in fitness technology is really fitness fitting into a really an ecosystem of a lot of different things. Uh, trend watches is termed it betterment. I don't know what the right term is. We'll use the term betterment. We like that term, but it's kind of a new paradigm of products and services and, and kind of thinking that all interrelate with each other. So fitness, you can't be your optimal from a fitness perspective without great nutrition, without the proper amount of rest. Uh, you can't do it as well without the proper tools, you know, the integration of healthcare to fitness, uh, the social connection component and how digital is becoming ubiquitous. So all these seven key parts are really symbiotic, and the marketplace is increasingly crossing over to consumers across these various silos and creating different types of new user experiences. So what I want to do now is dive into these seven kind of silos and relate some of the trends that we just touched upon to show you examples of how the market is presently delivering new concepts and models uh, to consumers, and also to paint the picture of what's likely to continue to come in that regard. So first, when we talk about nutrition, obviously what we eat uh, is very important to our well-being. 
And this is a great example of a service that reflects data collection, personalization, uh, customization, and delivery uh, new business models. So Habit takes uh, basically a test kit to take a little blood, sweat, and DNA. Uh, it uploads that through testing into a private and personalized profile that your nutritional plan is based upon. It uses a platform to provide coaching around nutrition and, and habit knowing this. And now it has moved to personalizing fresh, customized meals and eating plans for delivery to you. And when you think about what this model delivers, and there are others like this, and we'll continue to see this emerge as Blue Apron and others have come to market in different ways, it's a very affordable solution for people. You know, it wouldn't have been that long ago than the idea of having a medical professional, a nutritionalist, and a chef available to customize nutrition for you would have been something only the very, very wealthy could have afforded. And now we see these models coming to market that are adopting these technologies in ways that enable that for a far larger uh, percentage of the population to help them be their best. Other examples of technologies being applied in nutrition continue to improve. Nutrition in a pocket like Snap-It, which uh, has become increasingly accurate in its ability to take a picture and give you nutritional information, which is amazing. Water log for hydration, shop well to scan products and tell you what their contents are. We look at mindfulness, and that's the brain exercise component. We have now inexpensive devices that measure activity in the brain and help you create a state of mind. And ELF does that. So if you want to concentrate, you want to de-stress, you want to sleep, use biofeedback to teach you how to get your mind in the optimal space. Of course, we have now, even with WISA, on-demand psychotherapy via AI, which is very effective. It's, it's amazing where people are talking to a machine and they don't even realize it. And its uh, impact is very positive. In mindfulness as well, we have the Soma Dome, which is the meditation pod, creating really unique meditation experiences, using biofeedback and the environment to create a state of mind. Mindfulness is so important. It's a huge and growing area and a counterbalance to how technology has kind of overtaken many of our lives. In fitness, we see increasing functionality with sensors that are built into phones. Montezuma takes vibrations off of indoor cycles and accurately predict through algorithms uh, what cadence and eventually what power levels people are delivering into their outdoor cycles. Uh, we see Nudge and Forge providing customized uh, professional and um, personal fitness training to optimize people's fitness levels, all using technology and people together to deliver that experience. And of course, AI is in personal training, uh, which is uh, phenomenal. So V is a product that you've probably heard of. There are more and more of these that are coming out uh, that are taking data points with cognition and voice interface uh, to deliver customized and personalized training experiences. So we see how technology is running through fitness as well with VR. Maybe you saw the article yesterday by Sarah Needleman in the Wall Street Journal. Uh, that's my quote. You're going to see virtual reality as a gateway drug for people who aren't into fitness. Yes, I did say that. I might regret it, but I did. Uh, she showed examples of people playing tennis and various sports with VR in immersed uh, markets. As I mentioned in gaming, as I mentioned in the article, uh, we're a number of years away until consumer VR really becomes mainstream, but it is very real in our space. We have new business models. So the Uber of PT and training is coming. It's already here. We have products like Handstand uh, where you order them online and they show up at your house. We have FitSpot and others new business models that reach markets using technologies. Of course, then there's the social aspect of betterment, which is connection and the ability to connect across all these various platforms that exist in leveraging digital. And this covers a wide array of fitness users now, be it Swift, which is the indoor cycling community, uh, where you can participate with others in teams and races on the most famous uh, cycling courses outdoors in the world. Very cool product. I've used it. Uh, very engaging with uh, lots and lots of people participating as a community. And there are lots of these kind of online, offline uh, experiences going on around specific communities. Uh, new forms that we look at is engagement. So outdoor sporting activities and various events. 
Perhaps you saw the new iPhone 8 come out. Uh, augmented uh, reality is built into the product. So here's an example of a major league baseball game where in looking at it through your iPhone, you can see the statistics of the various players, including their identities. So this is an example of how the digital and physical world are merging around experience, creating deeper engagement and connection. And we're really only limited by our imagination and how these things can and will be applied increasingly over the coming years. When we look at healthcare, of course, there's a lot of testing that is being supplanted by much less expensive technologies. Uh, now, accurate EKGs, like through cardio with, the, uh, with your phone or smartwatch, uh, can get EKGs on demand very inexpensively, and they're highly accurate. We see Synosis, which was just acquired by Google use built-in technologies that are already part of uh, all our smartphones. So for example, using the camera and the light being emitted around the camera, uh, the device can look through a finger and uh, measure hemoglobins in blood. Similarly, the microphone can record breathing and uh, detect asthma and emphysema. So it's very powerful what these algorithms and sensor data points are able to do from a healthcare perspective dropping cost and increasing access significantly. A big, big growing market in healthcare and digital experience around betterment is longevity. And we're really going to see that become a bigger and bigger thing as people in my age range, you know, what's important for you is health preservation and wealth preservation. So there's going to be a lot of emergence in longevity efforts and a lot of uh, growing marketplace for services around helping people uh, get older in a more healthy fashion. So we'll see technology really impact. On the wearables component of the seven uh, silos we talked about, it's not just about wearables. I think wearables is kind of a, a bad name. Wearables is just a term for sensors you might put on your body, but it's becoming more than that. Uh, fashion is a big component of self-expression, and we're finding embedded technologies in a lot of different clothing options from shirts to pants to shoes, you name it, many things. This is Bandier in New York. They're a fashion business that has fitness integrated. And of course, Intel, uh, the wearable technology report is very insightful. Interactive clothing is going to become a bigger and bigger market, addressing all kinds of various uh, sensor and data collection points. A great example is in shoes and the applications range from uh, measuring people's gates and using algorithms to predict neurological problems or strokes before they happen. Uh, detecting hydration issues, detecting many other uh, anomalies and physical or medical conditions before they become problematic. And this is going to be a big area, as well as in the fitness area with heart rate, perspiration rates, uh, all these various uh, skin temps, all these various things. And we have form and function around fashion and self-expression with Mode of the Ring, which is a wearable device. We we'll see a lot more jewelry and different devices that we wear in different places, both collecting data and, and delivering experience to the users. We've even seen the Nike self-lacing shoes with a motor inside that adjusts to your foot. Very cool stuff. We're going to see more and more things like that. And then finally is digital itself, the seventh pillar. And as I mentioned in the beginning, we're going to see this new era of ubiquity where technology is going to move away from gadgets and things to become more like the air we breathe. So instead of having to Google on a laptop to find out what the weather is going to be looking like now, I can talk to my uh, Echo device Alexa anywhere I'm in my house within earshot and say, what's the weather like today? And she's going to tell me. So it's like she's there without having to be there. It's going to be the same with things like driverless cars, where our children in the next 30 years are not going to understand what it really means to say, I'm driving, because they're going to believe cars always drove themselves. So the technology becomes embedded to the point we don't even realize it's there. And that's what digital frictionless means. We're going to see that with respect to our lives and how we manage priorities. Already, we have bots that are starting to manage in an automated fashion schedules. Uh, digital assistants are going to become a very growing aspect of app with AI applications to help our lives, to help know what we should be eating, when we should be doing whatever we are supposed to be doing and learning all the time based on our actions, what is optimal for our state of being. The other thing around frictionless is really becoming more and more valuable through anticipation. 
So as I mentioned before, the acquisition of Whole Foods by Amazon is really the further fray into Amazon knowing what you want and delivering your groceries before you're really even ready to know what you need. Both saving you time, uh, making sure that you're not spoiling or wasting food uh, because it knows what you have and what you don't have and what you need. It's kind of like the Apple now, where before uh, you would buy albums. Now, based on what you're listening to, it's going to offer up songs that you never would have thought of based on knowing what you like and what others like you like. So it's where algorithms are collecting data, uh, using cognition to become more and more valuable to the user without them even understanding. They just know that it's better than it used to be. And then finally, in Japan, this really came through with the SoftBank's huge venture capital firm and seeing because of Japan's aging population uh, and their need for labor, which they have a shortage of labor in many markets, is the applications of robots and humanoid-like devices that are going to be able to take the place of people in key service roles for different organizations. And this is very real. You're going to see this adopted in fast food. You're going to see this adopted in medicine and healthcare. You're going to see this adopted eventually uh, in travel, in many different industries, where service personnel are going to actually be robotic. This is a technology that is already here, and it's going to become very mainstream within the next five years, uh, and extremely mainstream in the next decade. So these are real new, new tools of the future. And then finally, relative to digital, is the idea that gadgets are going to start disappearing. As frictionless digital becomes more and more relevant, uh, we're seeing this now with Apple's third watch where you can make phone calls without the need to have a smart device. So as technologies continue to shrink, as the power of processes continues to go up, as the ubiquity of the internet continues to be available on high speeds, the smaller and smaller hardware will be able to work with other things and do more and more powerful things to the extent that it will be like, in fact, the air we breathe. So in wrapping up, and I'm hoping you're enjoying this and found it a little different than what you might have seen before, we think when we talk about the latest fitness trends, that fitness is really melding into the betterment model. It's one part of seven different silos uh, that are surrounding the area of betterment, with fitness being just, just one. We mentioned that you know business models and organizational constructs are shifting in how they create value more to an idea of collecting a lot of information and to be able to analyze that effectively to build more relevancy and value to users over time. So as we adopt and use a service over time, it becomes more and more valuable to us. This is the new economic value creation model. When we look through the lens of technology, it's not technology itself. It's technology as a tool to apply to these four key drivers for all organizations omnipresence, service delivery whenever and wherever, personalization of service, learning what people really want and delivering that to them in a personalized way, aesthetic user design, frictionless use, the thing that makes it so easy and beautiful and simplistic to use that you want to use it, you're happy to use it, it's valuable to you, and finally, sustainability, making business models more inexpensive to operate, more efficient in their value that they deliver, these are the four drivers we need to keep in mind when we're looking at technology and expect the shift away from the current negative consequences to a more ubiquitous delivery of technologies that become like the air we breathe, more and more powerful, more able to impact our business models and, and industry spaces to grow them in the various silos that I showed you. Keep in mind the books that I shared with you and the quotes of some of these leaders about where we are in the knee of the curve. Sometimes uh, it seems things aren't changing as fast as they actually are, and we're really on the precipice of a massive adoption of these things that I'm showing you now that are going to grow our industry space, and they're gonna, there's going to be a tremendous amount of innovation in the coming years. It's upon us to deliver products and services we would have never thought of before. And finally, I want to thank all of you for being here and looking and listening. Uh, you're going to be able to find this content, as we mentioned in the podcast. We're going to be sharing the webinar in the next day and uh, sharing the deck for you to use on SlideShare. We thank you for participating and supporting Fitzy. 
Brian believes that developing omnipresence will be the key to our success in the digital world. Whatever we do as an industry should have a physical, digital, and hybrid version. To truly lead in the era of exponential technology, our products and services need to be available wherever and whenever our customers and communities choose to participate. When it comes to services, Brian's guidance and research shows that tech must be extremely relevant, contextualized, and personalized to the user. The more personalized it is, the more valuable it becomes. It's critical to keep the user experience in mind, especially in such a high-touch and intimate setting, like the fitness space. That user experience must be beautiful, simplistic, and frictionless. When we look through the lens of tech, we must see it as a tool to apply the four key drivers for all organizations, including omnipresence, personalized service, delivery wherever and whenever, aesthetic UX design with frictionless use, and lastly, sustainability. Brian reminds us that we now are at the precipice of a mass adoption at the knee of the curve, and now is the time to explore how this will transform all the operations, both inside and outside, of your fitness business. Thank you for listening to the Fitness Plus Technology Podcast. Here's a quick message from Brian O'Rourke. Hello, everyone. This is Brian O'Rourke. Thanks for listening to the Fitness Plus Technology Podcast. I also want to extend our thanks to Josh and the many, many wonderful professionals who've contributed their time and expertise for free for the health club and fitness industry at large. Wouldn't you like your fitness brand, product, or service to be featured on a podcast like this? I know I would. And that's why the Fitness Industry Technology Council, myself, and our companies like Moon Mission Media, Bideri Ventures, and Vertimax, among others, have been underwriting the podcast for the last nine months. Check the show notes for details and consider becoming a sponsor. It's a great way to reach thousands of industry professionals in the fitness and health club space and be a part of educating people on technology adoption and all the opportunities it's going to provide. So please consider joining us here at the podcast and we look forward to the many series of podcasts ahead. Thanks so much.